friends in Suva, Fiji. Beulah is in New Albany, Indiana. Trace is in Newfoundland, Canada. Siachifuwe is in Zambia. Hannah is in Thailand. Thanks to you for being part of Hope Awakens. I'm John Bradshaw. This is Hope Awakens, presented by It Is Written, and coming to you from the George Vanderman Studio in Collegedale, Tennessee, just outside Chattanooga. Hope Awakens is happening at all because of the prayers and the generous support of our It Is Written partners. Thank you. I'm truly grateful. You too can support Hope Awakens by going to itiswritten.com or simply to hopeawakens.org. Your kindness will help us to be able to do this again. And we're going to announce our plans on Tuesday to let you know what is happening next. Now, I do want to tell you about this. Esperanza en Jesus starts tomorrow night at 7 Eastern. That's our series in Spanish presented by Pastor Robert Costa. You can find the link to Esperanza en Jesus at hopeawakens.org. Please do tell someone. And soon we'll be presenting Hope Awakens in Icelandic and French and Italian and other languages. We will let you know more. Now, something additional. This Sunday evening at 7, at 7 Eastern, you can join Doug and me in our Facebook group, the It Is Written Official Community Facebook group. We're going to be answering more of your Bible questions, also praying for your prayer requests. But we've got so many questions, we can't get through them. So we will answer some more questions uh, Sunday night at 7. If you're not part of the group, you can submit a request to join the group or uh, register at hopeawakens.org to receive an invitation to that group. I'll tell you more about it tomorrow as well. Remember, it's at hopeawakens.org where you can find resources, previous presentations, submit your questions, time for your questions now, and to ask them, Doug Na'a. Hey, John, it's good to be here. We've got some good questions tonight. So here's our first one. What is meant by Romans chapter 5, verse 20? And it reads, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abound, grace did much more abound. Now, does this get rid of the law? Oh, it absolutely does not. Not in any way at all. I'll tell you what it does. It says that uh, you can't out -sin the grace of God. Wherever there's sin, there's grace. The law is still in effect. There must be because sin is the transgression of the law. <coughs> but what a gracious God. Where there's a lot of sin, there's a lot more grace. So tonight you can take that verse as your assurance that there is hope for you. If we're not saved by works, then why did Jesus say in Revelation 22 verse 14, Behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give everyone according as his work shall be? Yeah, good question. Well, here's the answer. We're not saved by our works, but our works demonstrate whether we have salvation. You go into a room and there are 10 lamps in the room and they're all plugged in and all switched on. Five of them, the light <coughs> is going. Five of them, the light is not. The light demonstrates which lamps are worth something, which lamps are functional. In the same way, your works don't save you, but they give evidence that you have been saved. That's why we're judged by our works. Now, I know that when we are saved, we receive the Holy Spirit. But here's the question. Now, does the Holy Spirit remain with us or does He come and go? Well, it kind of depends about the way you live your life and whether you remain open to the Holy Spirit. If you remain open to the Holy Spirit and continue to ask that God will give you fresh streams of His Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will stay right with you. When we pray, do we need to ask for the Holy Spirit or is the Holy Spirit within us from the time we are born? Oh, no, no, it doesn't work like that. You pray, well, you come to Christ and accept Jesus, the Holy Spirit is given. Uh, I, I, I pray every day that God will fill me again with His Holy Spirit. But this is not something that you're born with and you just hang on to through life. It doesn't work like that. Now, how can we... Uh, claim God's Bible promises without doubting? For example, when natural disasters occur, some are saved by others are not? Yeah, well, don't doubt God. You can claim the promises without doubting by claiming them and not doubting. Now, you, you say two people were in a vehicle or, or, or a hurricane came or some such thing. Some survived and some did not. You know, that's just a tough thing. It just is. But you don't want to charge God with unfairness or unjustness. That's kind of the mystery that we'll have explained to us 
throughout eternity. Claim the promises of God. Be strengthened in your faith because of what the Bible says, not because of the providences that you see or discern, not because you had a good day or a bad day, someone survived or somebody died. We claim the promises of God because God is always and only and will forever be good. Now, every time I start to get closer to God, it seems like I start to feel something is pulling me away and I get distracted. And so what should I do? Well, just keep on coming back. If you're praying and your mind wanders, bring it back. If you're going through life and you get forgetful, bring it back. Continue to read the Bible and pray. Read the Bible and pray. It might be too that there's garbage in your life that you need to get out. It's competing for that space in your mind. But, but being a human is all about being, you know, less than perfect. You continue to grow. You, you grow. So as you develop, just keep on bringing your mind back. It's going to work out okay. Now, John, is there anything wrong with staying home and watching church rather than physically going to church? Not if you're staying home and you're watching It Is Written TV. (laughs) Under that circumstance, it's 100% all right. Really, the Bible says that we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves. Go to church. Go to, you will be blessed and you, by not going to church, you're depriving others of the blessing of your presence. We're an army, you know, not not a, a, a bunch of disconnected units. Press together is what we want to do. Go to church. If you can't, if you can't, if you're unwell or you can't get out, you don't drive well or the weather's lousy, that's understood. But I don't think that's the question. If you're able to enjoy the fellowship of church family. Now, why won't God answer my prayer for my children's salvation as he did when he answered my prayer for my salvation? Well, that's because the will of your children is involved. God's not going to force his will on there. So keep praying, keep praying. They've got to come to the place where they surrender and they say yes to Jesus, just like you did. Now, the Bible teaches us that the bad guys that crucified Jesus, they will be risen to see Jesus return. And then I presume they're going to die again. And then at the end of the 1000 years, they're going to be resurrected again. Now, does that make the three deaths? As a matter of fact, it does. The Revelation chapter 20, Revelation 20 talks about the second death. But for those, sounds like there's going to be three. That's right. Now, if I'm struggling with cigarette smoking, sugar, caffeine, when Jesus comes, will I not be allowed to get into heaven? Oh, now let's not look at it like this. And by the way, why are you assuming that you might be struggling with those things when Jesus comes back? Here's what we're going to do. We're going to say, we'll surrender our heart to Jesus. He will take them away. He'll give us the victory. And we won't have to worry about that because that's what God is able to do. Remember, where there's sin, and I hate to frame it like that, there is much more grace. So claim that grace and God will strengthen you in your weaknesses. Now, Genesis 2 verse 9 says, there were two trees planted in the garden of Eden. One was the tree of life. The other was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, in verse 17, it says they weren't to eat of one tree in the garden. And that was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, were they permitted to eat from the tree of life? Not after sin. No, no. As a matter of fact, they were expelled from the Garden of Eden and God stationed an angel with a flaming sword to keep them from getting back in. So no more tree of life. Sin would have been immortalized. Now, John, why do we have to go through Jesus to the Father? Why can't we just go directly to God the Father? Oh, well, you could, but here's the reason we pray in the name of Jesus is because we are saying, Father, I am presenting the merits of the shed blood of Jesus. I'm coming in faith in Jesus because he's the one who died for me. We have access to the Father through Jesus for Jesus died and gave his life for us. It's faith that has us go through Jesus to the Father. Now that churches are closed and we have a six feet distance policy, how can we baptize people safely? Oh, you know, I don't know, except I did see a photograph of a baptism recently uh, where people were baptized wearing masks and that seemed to be very safe. I'm sure it ha- for the most part, I believe baptisms were delayed for the most part. So, you know, I don't know. I think you just take special care. That would be appropriate. Now, if Sabbath is from sunset to sunset, uh, what's it like for those that live up in the Arctic Circle where the sun does not go down in midsummer and does not rise up uh, until the winter? Oh, interesting. Yeah, but if you look at the, at the, at the tables, you can find them online, sunset times. There's always a sunset and there's always a sunrise everywhere at all time of the year. Now, I don't know if that means that the sun actually dips below the horizon or if it simply means when it gets to its lowest point. But there's a sunset time and a sunrise time every day, even for the North Pole, no problem. Now, isn't there a Bible verse that states that 
if you bless anything, uh, food first, you can, you, you can eat it, it's okay? No. I think what is meant is 1 Timothy chapter 4. I think, I think that's the place. We're going to find out. Well, I'll turn there now. You just ask a blessing and the food is okay? No. Yeah, that's the question. No, no, no. Oh, yes, here's the verse. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, if it be received with thanksgiving. So you can pray over a rat. Thank you for the rat. Thank you for the cockroach. Thank you for the slug. I don't mean to be ridiculous, but if we go down that road, it gets ridiculous. Verse five is where you find the balance. For it is sanctified by, wait for it, by the word of God and prayer. So it's not just a matter of praying. The food needs to be sanctified or set apart by the word of God as well. And when we studied a couple of nights ago, we found out that the Bible sets apart certain things to eat and says there are some things that we shouldn't eat. You can't believe that every creature ever made was designed to be eaten. That was not the case, particularly when in the beginning, it wasn't God's plan that we eat animals at all. Now, there seems to be a line of demarcation between the health principles of the Old Testament and that of the New Testament. But doesn't Colossians chapter 2 give us that freedom that was non-existent in the Old Testament? And uh, aren't we making a lot of man-made rules with a lot of do's and don'ts here, John? Yeah, that's an interesting question, isn't it? Now, there's three points I'm going to make. One, good question. Two, there's no demarcation. That is, when Jesus died on the cross, the ceremonial law ended. No more sacrifices, no more feast days. The third point is freedom. You're saying that God set us free from those health principles. Uh, what you're saying is that God set us free to get disease, to get uh, uh, heart attacks, to, to, to get ill health. No, wait a minute. God gave those principles to us to free us from ill health. The freedom is found in embracing the principles. That's where the freedom is. So don't for a moment think that God was somehow loading you up with a rule or that anyone who believes or advocates that is into man-made rules. This is a Bible principle, nothing ceremonial about a pig or a catfish. Dear Pastor John, I have been struggling with this constant comparison with the death of my mother and my grandfather. My mom was a vegan. She lived a healthy life, never drank or smoked in her whole entire life. She exercised constantly and she lived the Christian life. She died at the age of 65 to cancer. However, my grandfather, he smoked, drank and ate everything possible, but yet he lived till 97 years of age. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? My mother lived to be 92 years of age and I'm convinced the reason she lived to 92 was that she quit smoking at the age of 85. I said to my doctor, how did she do that? Her lungs had to be like lumps of coal. He said, good genes. I don't know how anyone's genes could be that good, but you know how it goes. Some people live long, some people live very well and die early. Here's the point. It's not who got the most years, it's who A, honored God, B, had the peace of mind that comes from walking in the light, and C, there's quality of life, and D, where are you going after this life? It's not all about the amount of years that you stack up one above the other. Don't worry about those inequities. Eternity is going to take care of all of that. When we get to heaven, there will be no more sin. Amen. Isn't that taking away our freedom of choice? Oh, no, no. That's honoring our freedom of choice because in heaven, our choice will be not to sin. Uh, no, no, no sin because we won't want to. Now, what do you think about drinking wine. No, I'm good, thanks. I'm fine. No, <laughs> because it me. says in the Bible that they were drunk. Can you explain, please? Yeah, anyone who was drunk was foolish in the Bible. I mean, it didn't work out well for Noah if you read what happened in his day. Yeah, people got drunk. Nothing good about it. Wasn't designed to be that way by God. Now, I missed your presentation on April the 18th. Can you send me information on where I could watch it? As a matter of fact, I'll send that to you right now without a stamp. Hopeawakens.org, previous presentations. You can find them there. Now, Luke chapter 7, verse 33 to 35 would make some people think that Christ got drunk. How do I explain this to a friend who argues that possibility? It reads, For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say he has a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, Look, 
a glutton and a wine bibber, yep. a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yep. But wisdom is justified by all her children. Yeah, that's right. That means people are going to believe what they want to believe. And that might be where, you, where your friend is coming from right now. Um, here's how you answer that question for yourself or anybody else. These were false accusations. Jesus was accused of a lot of stuff that he never did. Now, they accused him of being what? A wine bibber and also a glutton. Was he a glutton? No. False accusation. Same for the wine bibber thing. How do I get hope awakens in Spanish? Ah, mentioned that before. Uh, this is Esperanza in Jesus, Saturday night. Go to hopeawakens.org, find the link there, and by all means, share it far and wide. Now, John, what can I do to draw myself closer to Jesus with all of the distraction in the world today? Yeah, well, some of that you just got to push out, cancel your cable subscription, uh, give away your season tickets. Sometimes that's what you got to do. But for, we, we, aren't, we, we haven't been called to live on mountaintops as hermits. Uh, read your Bible. Just have a, have a strong devotional life. Do that. Have a real devotional life and spend time with God. That'll see you, that'll see you right. Make this the last question. Sure. Now, during Noah's time, only Noah and his family were saved. During Lot's time, only Lot and uh, his family were saved. Now, does that mean only a few people will be saved at the return of Jesus? Frankly, it does. Yeah, not that few, not just eight on an ark or lot and a handful of family members. Many are called, few are chosen. That's correct. It will not be an overwhelmingly large group. It will be a minority saved at last. Thanks, Doug. Well done. Appreciate yes, that. Yes, very good questions. Let's do that again tomorrow morning. I've got a special guest that I want to bring to you right now. My special guest is Pavel Goya a pastor, an author, an editor, and an international speaker. And one of his favorite subjects is prayer. Pastor Goya, thank you for joining me. My privilege to be here, Pastor John. Well, let's talk about prayer. Let's start at the beginning. How should a person pray? Well, uh, it is easy, but not so easy. We need to remember the disciples, when they saw Jesus praying, they Notice that he prayed differently and they said to him, teach us how to pray. Therefore, we should not assume that we just uh, know how to pray. Like Paul says in Romans that we don't even know how to pray. Therefore, I want to mention a couple of things. Number one, uh, we can learn from the Bible how to pray. Jesus taught them how to pray. Not that we should repeat the Lord's prayer word by word, but that in it we find the, the spine, the principles the main points of what prayer has to be focused on. And I'm going to name them quick. Number one, the first part of the prayer focuses on God. And the second part focuses on self. Now, before is like a sandwich. Before you start, prayer starts with praises and ends with praises. And in the middle, you focus on God and then you on your needs. Now, I need to say, uh, I did some survey when I worked on my project on prayer <clears throat> and about 92% of the prayers that I heard in the churches, about 92% were focused on self. Bless me, heal me, help me, my job, my school, my family. A very little focus on God. And people struggle when they pray specifically because they keep their eyes on problems, on self, instead of keeping their eyes on Jesus. So number one, in prayer, the more we focus on God, the more we understand how good, how great he is the less we focus on problems, the, the more confident, the more peace we have, the more faith, then our problems seem to be smaller and smaller because we have a big God, because we know him. And so that would be an important point to focus on God. But number two, sure, it's a lot to talk. I mean, the prayer seminar will take about 12 hours. But number two, that is very important. Prayer, it's a conversation. It's the opening of the heart to God as to a friend. Prayer is not a routine, it's not a duty, it's not a poetry that you don't even need to think. Prayer is when you have an open, honest conversation with God. He knows your thoughts, he knows your heart anyway, but you express yourself in respect, but yet honesty. And this way, prayer becomes meaningful. Fantastic. Now, I've got a question for you. If someone's already a praying person, they say, I've heard some of these things, but I'd like to improve my prayer life. What would you suggest to that person? So um, 
very important. Uh, you cannot learn to drive unless you drive. You cannot learn to swim unless you jump in the water. You cannot learn to pray unless you keep praying. That's the reason the Bible says pray without ceasing. Basically, I would suggest that they continue to pray. In fact, I would suggest that they double it. If you pray 15 minutes a day, pray 30. And then I'm going to say this. Prayer and study should always go together because prayer is a dialogue. Through prayer, we talk to God. And through his word, God talks to us. So pray and study because the closer you get to God, the more you know him, the more you understand him, the better you know to communicate with him. And I want to mention that in the Bible, God talks to his people. Always from Genesis to Revelation, and God doesn't change. We, we change. Jesus says, my sheep know my voice. In Revelation, he says, he who has ears to listen. In Isaiah, it says, you'll hear a voice behind you. So basically, we need to learn not only to talk, but to study and let God talk to us in a way that it becomes a dialogue. So the more people pray and the more they study, the more they know how to pray. Tell me about a special answer to prayer that you've had. Oh, there are so many. I'm going to just uh, uh, give one right now. Um, I was born and raised in Romania during communism. And uh, it was, uh, people here may understand a little of it, but unless you live in that context, it's very difficult to fully understand what it means to have no freedom. I mean, think about North Korea, think about Cuba. Anyway, and um, we had school all week long except Sunday. And if you miss school for one day, uh, they would excuse you. But if you miss school to go to church, it was the end of the world. Basically, you would lose school. And they warned me, you never come Saturdays to school. We know you are an Adventist. We know you go to church. So this is the deal. If you are sick, we excuse you. If you are lazy, we talk to you. But if you go to church in this country, we don't believe in God. We are communist. There is no God. So next sat Saturday, if you miss school, it will be the end of your education. We will expel you with no right to ever register again in any school for the rest of your life. It will be the end of my education. It was a tough decision. It's easy to tell the story, but it's difficult to go through a challenge like that. Lose your job, lose your school, you know. And so uh, I prayed. That's what Christians do. And I said, Lord, please save my education. Please, Lord. And, and, and it seemed to me that the more I prayed, the more worried I was and it, it, my prayer would bounce to, to the ceiling and come back to me without any answer. And uh, I called my dad. I said, listen, I'm praying and I get no answer. And my father said to me, uh, what are you praying for? I said, well, that God will save my education. And my father said, did you ask him if it's his will? Because, you know, uh, we always say, may your will be done and we need to mean what we say. We need to accept God's will in faith because he knows the future. And I said, well, uh, I know his will, but I don't want to lose my education. And uh, I said, what should I do? Should I go to school on Saturday uh, and give up church? Or? And my father said, son, do you love God? I said, yes. With all your heart, I said, yes. More than anything else, yes. Okay, you got your answer, bye. He hung up on me. Oh, I got so frustrated. I called him back. I said, listen, what should I do? He says, do you love God? I said, yes, you asked me before with all your heart, all your mind. Yes, more than anything, God comes first. Yes, then you got your answer. I said, I didn't, what should I do? He said, hey son, do you love God or you love school? And then I really kind of got it because before I, I kind of refused to get it. And uh, I said, can I have both? And my father said, listen, whatever comes between you and God, that's your God. You may think that you are a Christian, but before you put God first, and you are ready to surrender everything else, and you are ready to be dead to the world and to be dead to self before you hate everything else, you are not a Christian. And I said, why should I lose everything? And my father said to me, it's not that you lose, it's that you gain God. And sometimes people ask for blessings without God. Blessings are not UPS to us. When you get God, his presence brings the blessings. If you really want God, that's when you get the other things. You need to seek first him. And I said, well, uh, so what should I do? He says, you need to step out in faith and let him do his will. Be ready to forget your school and your life. And so bottom line, I prayed a different prayer. Instead of saying, Lord, save my education. My father told me, pray for God, don't pray for self. Focus on God, don't focus on self. I said, what do you mean? Pray that he will do 
o adevărut honor him, not o adevărut honor you. So I said, Lord, this is a tough prayer. I'm going to pray differently today. So far I prayed for three days between Monday and Wednesday for my education. I got no answer. Now I'm going to pray differently. I am willing to give up my education, do whatever you want, but do what would serve you because these people are communists. They don't know God. So if me losing education would honor you, let me lose it. All like right. Joseph. All right. so, so what happened? We got to know what happened. What happened? What happened? And so what happened after I prayed, I went to school and the secretary told me, you are crazy. There is no God. Nobody can help you from a communist government. Nobody can save you. I told her, God can save me if he wants, but I am willing to even lose my school. Next day was Friday. I went to school and the secretary was kind of yellow. I said, do you have fever? You have a virus or something? She says, no. She says, do you know the president of the country, Ceausescu? I said, from TV? No, no, no. Are you friends? Is he your buddy? Do you eat together, family? I said, are you crazy? Who can get close to that guy? I'm not friends with him. All I know about government is that I go in front of the government building and there are thousands of roses and I take a flower and give it to my wife. That's all the government I know. And she says to me, do you know what happened today at 8 a.m.? I said, no clue. She says, they planned, the school planned to expel you tomorrow. But today at 8 a.m., the country president gave a law. He said, in order to save the economy, starting today, we close all schools in the whole country on every Saturday. From now on, there will be no school on Saturdays. Unbelievable. And Wonderful. so God gave, and she said to me, there is a God in heaven. I said, lady, yes, I is. told, and I called my father and he said, son, when you honor God, he honors you. Amen. Pavel, thank you. What a blessing. What an encouragement. Pray. And God answers prayer. This has been so good. Let's pick this up tomorrow morning. We'll speak again. Would that be okay? Absolutely. My privilege. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. And God bless you, Pavel Goya. I hope you're encouraged to take time to pray and know that God will hear and answer. Come on, let's pray together now. Our Father, as we open the Bible, we ask for your blessing. We thank you for your presence. And we pray for clarity in our minds. Guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. It was June of 1987. President of the United States was Ronald Reagan, a former actor, former governor of California, elected president in 1980, re-elected in 1984. In 1981, President Reagan was shot outside a hotel in Washington, D.C. The reason he wasn't wearing a bulletproof vest was because the only time he would be outside and vulnerable to an assassin would be right after a speech. He would only have to walk for 30 feet but that's when it happened. Six years later, President Reagan, the man they called the Great Communicator, was in a city that today does not exist. He was in West Berlin, a city which had been divided since 1961 by the Berlin Wall. As East Germany was very closely linked to the Soviet Union, President Reagan took the opportunity to use his speech to address the Soviet Premier Mikhail Gorbachev. The speech is notable today for a now famous line, a line that almost wasn't included in the speech. However, President Reagan liked the line. He said, let's leave it in. He began in, or, or he said in his speech, there is one sign the Soviets can make that would be unmistakable, that would advance dramatically the cause of freedom and peace. General Secretary Gorbachev, if you seek peace, if you seek the prosperity for the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, if you seek liberalization, come here to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate, the crowd cheered wildly. He said, Mr. Gorbachev, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Seems strange now, East Germany, Soviet Union, West Berlin, East Berlin. At the end of the Second World War, Germany was divided into four zones under the control of the United States, Britain, France, and the Soviet Union. Berlin was also split among the four powers. The American, British, and French sectors formed West Berlin. and The Soviet sector became East Berlin. After World War II, communist governments friendly to the Soviet Union were established across Europe. Countries such as Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Bulgaria, and Romania. East Germany was created in 1949. From a Soviet point of view, 
It was advantageous to have a friendly cluster of countries nearby, owing to the establishment of NATO in 1949, set up to provide security for Western nations against the Soviets. And all of this is what was known as the Cold War, the United States and its allies in a standoff with the Soviet Union and its allies. President Reagan spoke up that day, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And just over two years later, owing to a variety of factors, the Berlin Wall fell. As unlikely as it seemed not many years earlier, European communism fell. It fell in Poland in 1989, same year in Hungary. The Velvet Revolution in Czechoslovakia saw communism defeated there in 89. Bulgaria ousted communism in 1990. The death of President Nicolae Ceausescu on Christmas Day in 1989 meant change was coming to Romania. Remember, Yugoslavia was not long ago a country made up of states that are now countries in their own right. Bosnia and Herzegovina, Croatia, Serbia, Macedonia, Montenegro, Slovenia, countries all today, remembering that Macedonia is officially named North Macedonia now. Albania was a communist country. So what we know is there have been epic political changes over the last few decades. Unimaginable. It reflects that human beings have this almost boundless desire for control. We've seen great empires over the years. The Roman Empire, stretching from a Hadrian's Wall right over to the Middle East. But now the Roman Empire is no more. Just a cluster of ruins, really. It was said the sun never set on the British Empire, an empire that governed more than a quarter of the world. The Russian Empire, the Spanish Empire, they came and went. The Maya built Chichen Itza. The Egyptians built the pyramids. The Inca built Machu Picchu. The Khmer Empire built Angkor Wat. But none of those empires exist today. Empires rise and fall. Today's undeniable superpower is the United States a country that has grown militarily and economically in almost unbelievable ways in a very short time. From warring with Britain in 1812 and the civil war in the 1860s, the United States has wrestled with its own growing pains and internal strife to become what it is today, a truly global power. Today, the other major powers in the world would include Russia and China. But isn't it true that change can come quickly? Whoever would have predicted that something like a global pandemic caused by a simple virus would have had such a dramatic effect? What it'll mean for the balance of power in the world isn't known. No one's predicting it will bring about a shuffling of the global order. But things can change, and they do. So what will things look like as we enter the future? Of course, that's not something we can easily predict. But as we look at the Bible, we see there's a certain shifting of influence in the world and something is going to happen to influence the world and cause people to look in what might be for them a new direction. Revelation 13.3 speaks of a time when all the world marveled and followed a power that would have a huge influence in earth's last days. The question of who or what will dominate Earth's final days can get muddled if your focus is in the wrong place. When Jesus came to the world, even his closest followers were thinking about things from a worldly viewpoint. That's reflected in this interesting request. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him. And he said to her, what do you wish? She said to him, Grant that these my two sons of mine may sit, one on your right hand and the other on your left in your kingdom. Jesus said in John 18, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I would not be delivered to the Jews. My kingdom now is not from here. In John 6, right after he'd fed a large crowd with the little boy's lunch, we read, Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and Take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. Jesus didn't come to set up an earthly kingdom, even as people in his day thought. The real battle for supremacy in this world today isn't a battle for international denomination, a domination. Go right back to the beginning with me. In heaven, Satan said, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the Most High. He came to earth 
tempted Adam and Eve and planted the seed of sin in this world. Now, what we see is the Tower of Babel, the rise of Egypt under the pharaohs. We see the rise of Babylon and then Medo-Persia, then Greece and then Rome. We read about the Assyrians who were profoundly cruel, the Philistines who seem to constantly be plaguing Israel. Interesting. When Jesus came to the world, Israel was occupied by and dominated by Rome. But Jesus didn't take the battle to Rome because the battle for the world wasn't, still isn't, that kind of battle. Notice what Jesus was trying to do. He was trying to reach hearts, to change minds, to influence people in the direction of His Father. When He prayed to His Father, He didn't talk about overthrowing kingdoms. He never said, Father, we got to get the Romans out of here. He said in John 17, 4, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And what was that? To glorify God. As Jesus said to Philip, he who has seen me has seen the Father. Didn't come for political reasons. The political battles weren't the battles he came to fight. What we see is the rise and the fall of kingdoms. What we see is what takes place on the surface, but beneath the surface is where the real battle is taking place. And that's the battle for the hearts and minds of the people of the world. That's what the prophetic issues are about in earth's last days. The issues spoken of in the book of Revelation. Keep this in mind. This is part of the final gospel message to go to the world. We got to look at it because it's part of the everlasting gospel. It's in Revelation 14. A third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or in his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. And back a few chapters, we read this. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. You see, humanity will be divided into these two groups, those marked with the mark of the beast and those sealed with the seal of God. And these signs reveal who has your heart, your loyalty. Because before Jesus comes back, it's going to be revealed who has chosen to follow Jesus and who has not. But let's look back at history. Because as we do, we see more clearly how the battle for the minds of the world will shape up. We're going to go back to the 16th century. Western civilization was rising. Spain became a great nation, an empire. The Portuguese empire was stretching across the globe. It was a time of great artistic accomplishments. Michelangelo created the David. Da Vinci finished the Mona Lisa. And just about 10 years after he did, Something else was brewing about 550 miles away. Up until this time, religious life in Western Europe had been governed by one church. And that church regulated life to quite an incredible degree. Many also felt that the church had drifted a long way from where it should have been to the extent that in a small German town, something happened that would shake the world wasn't the sort of town you would think would be an epicenter for a spiritual revolution. Some called the place miserable. One duke called it a hole. One theologian wrote to a friend of the poor, miserable, filthy little town of Wittenberg. Today, very pleasant. Population that hovers around 50,000. 60 miles southeast of Berlin, not far from Poland, sits on the Elbe River, which starts in the Czech Republic and flows through Germany past Hamburg, and to the North Sea. Martin Luther was born about 60 miles or 100 kilometers away. His father wanted him to become a lawyer and was appalled when a son entered a cloister to train to become a monk. But it was during his training as a priest, Luther discovered the Bible for the first time, a Latin Bible chained to a wall. He had never seen a whole Bible before. And as he read and studied the gospels and the epistles, His heart was moved. He was troubled by the sins in his personal life, wanted to find peace with God. So he did what the monastery said to do. He fasted, prayed for hours, even resorted to self-flagellation to rid himself of the evils of his human nature. He would later say that if the monk could obtain heaven by his monkish works, 
I should certainly have been entitled to it. But Luther had a mentor during his training, Johann von Staupitz. He would later say, if it had not been for Dr. Staupitz, I should have sunk in hell. Staupitz encouraged Luther by saying, instead of torturing yourself on account of your sins, throw yourself into the Redeemer's arms. Trust in him, in the righteousness of his life, in the atonement of his death. Listen to the Son of God. He became man to give you the assurance of divine favor. Love him who first loved you. It was in 1508, the same year Michelangelo began painting the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, that he accepted a call to teach at the University of Wittenberg. As a young monk, he'd been living a very strict life, but when he arrived in Rome on a visit, he found that priests and monks and bishops were living in luxury and debauchery. Troubled him. One thing troubled him profoundly. Pope Julius II made a decree that a special indulgence was available to those who would walk up on their knees on what had become known as Pilate's Staircase. Staircase was believed to have been the very staircase Jesus walked on during his trial before Pontius Pilate. The church claimed it had been miraculously transported from Jerusalem to Rome. Of course it hadn't. Luther wanted the indulgence, so he climbed those stairs on his knees, got to the top, and then reflected on whether or not there'd been any point to it. It dawned on him he'd been practicing salvation by works. The idea that a person's deeds are not just a response to God's grace, but they earn favor with God. Luther considered what he'd seen in the Bible, that the just shall live by faith, where Paul quoted Habakkuk. That statement changed his life and his ministry. Not long after, the church embarked on a grand new project, the building of the largest church in the world, St. Peter's Basilica, in what is now the Vatican City. To help pay for the project, the church offered its people the chance to buy indulgences for their sins. That's a way to reduce the amount of punishment you have to go through for your sins. So while it's not exactly the same as buying salvation, you are buying pardon for sin, which flies in the face of the entire Bible. Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Luther was troubled. His trouble deepened. A man named Johannes Tetzel was commissioned, began visiting the cities of Germany, selling indulgences. That might have got by Luther in the past, but now he understood something of the message of God's grace. He found that the trafficking of God's grace was sacrilegious. How could anyone purchase pardon for sin? or a reduction in their time in purgatory, even if there was a purgatory. He was strong in his opposition, wrote to the bishop and objected. And then on October 31, 1517, he made his objections public by nailing them to the door of this church, the Castle Church in Wittenberg. We visited there to film our 500 series. If you've not seen 500 by It Is Written, you gotta see it. The list of objections became known as his 95 Theses and the Protestant Reformation was launched. Europe, the world, would never be the same again. So what's in the 95 Theses? The first one lays the groundwork for all the others, also for the basic message of the Reformation as far as salvation was concerned. First Thesis states this, when our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said repent, He willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. Second one, this word cannot be understood as referring to the sacrament of penance, that is, confession and satisfaction as administered by the clergy. Later he wrote, therefore the Pope, when he uses the words plenary remission of all penalties, doesn't actually mean all penalties, but only those imposed by himself. Thesis 21, thus those indulgence preachers are in error who say that a man is absolved from every penalty and saved by papal indulgences. Very interesting. Sacraments of the church or the purchase of indulgences. They preach only human doctrines who say that as soon as the money clinks into the money chest, the soul flies out of purgatory. Thesis 86, why does not the Pope, whose wealth is today greater than the wealth of the richest Crassus, build this one basilica in St. Peter with his own money rather than with the money of poor believers? 
It's easy to see why Luther became unpopular with his church. His teachings quickly spread throughout Germany. They soon reached Rome. He was tried by his church more than once. Efforts were made to remove him, to kill him. When he appeared before a very important body in the city of Worms in Germany, he said this, I cannot submit my faith either to the Pope or to the councils because it is as clear as the day that they have frequently erred and contradicted each other. Unless therefore I am convinced by the testimony of scripture or by the clearest reasoning, unless I am persuaded by means of the passages I have quoted, and unless they thus render my conscience bound by the word of God, I cannot and I will not retract. For it is unsafe for a Christian to speak against his conscience. Here I stand. I can do no other. May God help me. Amen. His point was he couldn't submit his faith to a man, to a church leader. He said he would take his direction from the Bible. The church of the time wasn't doing that. The church was selling indulgences, giving people a chance to earn them in other ways. The church was dispensing forgiveness of sin. The church had taught that there was a place called purgatory, a place where people who weren't fit for heaven could go to be purged by fire of their sins. The church taught that God would torture the lost in hell forever without rest. The church was teaching that people could pray to saints in addition to praying to God through Jesus. Think about these points. Jesus found himself in a little strife with church leaders in his day. He said to a man one day, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason saying, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sin but God alone? They were upset that Jesus was forgiving sin. Of course, there was nothing wrong with Jesus doing that. He was the son of God. He was God. But for the church to do that, one challenge many people have seen over the years is that the church of Luther's day still claims to be able to forgive sin. Now, they'll tell you it's God who forgives. We just dispense the sacrament, except sacraments aren't biblical. And two, the Bible says there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Keep in mind, purgatory isn't biblical. It's taught as though it is, but there is no place God sends those unfit for heaven to be purged before going to heaven. And think of what that would be. What would it be if you could somehow be fitted for heaven by having your sins burned away? That would be salvation by works, not by grace. We're cleansed from our sins by the blood of Jesus, not by the fires of a mythical purgatory. The idea of an eternally burning hell is also not biblical. What are you saying about God if you suggest that he would burn people forever and ever without mercy? I had to be honest with myself one day because that's just what I'd been taught. And surely it, surely it isn't a, a matter of what seems right to us. You've got to go to the Bible. Look at what the Bible says. You must. When you do, you don't read that God will burn people forever and ever. We believe it because we were taught it. That's the only reason. Something else the church of Luther's day did. You remember we looked at this. Question, which is the Sabbath day? Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Question, why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Here's the answer. Because the Catholic church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday, and that's a teaching of Rome. And this fundamentalists meet for worship on Sunday, yet there is no evidence in the Bible that corporate worship was to be made on Sundays. The Jewish Sabbath or day of rest was, of course, Saturday. It was the Catholic Church that decided Sunday should be the day of worship for Christians in honor of the resurrection. That's serious. A church cannot change the law of God. So what you had over time was a move further and further away from the Bible for varying reasons. But people, and generally church people are what you'd graciously call good people, people moved away from the word of God, upstanding people. One tradition gives way to another and behind it all there's a power seeking to lead people away from the Bible, away from complete dependence on Jesus. It wasn't only Luther who spoke out against the church. Other reformers, not perfect people, but people teaching and following the light of the Bible, like Zwingli in northern Switzerland, 
Calvin in Geneva, along with William Farrell, John Knox of Scotland, John Wesley of England, William Tyndale, the Bible translator, many more. Go all the way back to John Wycliffe, the Bible translator from Lutterworth, England. They all agreed, and many others with them, that a system of Bible teaching that directed people away from Jesus as truly Lord and Savior was something that would cause great danger down in the close of time. In fact, the reformers pointed to the book of Revelation and spoke to today. In Revelation, you read about a beast. Now, of course, that doesn't sound like a nice thing, but it's simply a symbol. Where it says beast, it means nation. How do we know that? Remember that Revelation borrows much of its imagery from the Old Testament. That's the frame of reference John's readers had. John borrowed terms from the Old Testament. When he wanted to discuss nations, he used the same symbol Daniel had used. Daniel spoke of four nations and he said, I saw in my vision by night and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea and four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. And now we read the interpretation. Daniel 7, 17, those great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. Verse 23, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth. In fact, it goes on to say that a little horn would rise up out of the fourth kingdom, which we know is pagan Rome. Remember our sequence, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, same in Daniel 7 as Daniel 2. A little horn rises up. And those Protestant reformers I mentioned were convinced that was not the emperors of Rome, but the little horn was the church of Rome. Why did they think that? Because in Daniel 7, Daniel described the power in a number of specific ways. And many of those points are used in Revelation chapter 13, identifying the power that's going to be so influential in earth's last days. You don't want to be led away from a pure biblical faith in God. Today, people are confused. And and you know why? Because it's hard to know who to trust, who to listen to. So when it comes to your spiritual well-being, who do you listen to? Surely that answer is, we listen to God. Or maybe you're not sure how to do that because everyone has an idea or a view or an opinion. I want to tell you this. You can't go wrong if you simply decide to trust in God. You can't. You might not always get it right the first time, but if you're honest with God and you're willing to let Him lead you, He will do that. He'll lead you. He'll lead you in the path of the Bible. There is a spiritual enemy, and he's wanting to lead the world astray. It's not always going to be obvious. Paul wrote, and no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. That's why our trust must rest on the Bible. Forgiveness of sin? No, we don't visit a human for that. We go straight to God. That's clear. Praying to saints? Wait, praying to dead people? No, I don't think we do that. I've been invited to go straight to God with my petitions, my burdens, with whatever is on my list. Changing the law of God. We can't possibly accept that as appropriate. We can't say it doesn't matter. These are clear points. They're unambiguous. There's no need for any confusion. What's the issue in the world? There's a spiritual battle going on. A virus is causing havoc in the world. Why is that? Because long ago, a fallen angel determined to make the world as miserable as possible. He set about to prevent you and me from inheriting everlasting life. That's his goal. And some people he'll get to profess no faith in God and others he'll induce to be careless. But then there are those who want to honor God. What Satan wants to do with them is lead them to place their faith in the wrong place. Unfortunately, today, there is a system teaching traditions and errors in the place of the Bible. And the Bible identifies that as being the little horn of Daniel 7 and that first nation, that beast nation in Revelation chapter 13. 
And so God lovingly says, be careful, follow the Bible and not the teachings of that system, which will lead you astray. You know Jesus died for you. You're of value. It's through trusting in him that you can know your sins are forgiven and that you have a new heart. On the cross long ago, on the cross at Calvary, heaven demonstrated to you that God would do anything he could to reach you and save you. Sin causes death. Jesus said, I'll take that. I'll drink that cup. I'll suffer that so that she can live forever, so that he can have everlasting life. No matter how bad it seems your life has become, God is there for you. The cross still witnesses to the great love of God. How could the Son of God choose to die for broken people, for sinful people? How could he do that? Ah, but he did. He died for you and me. God's calling us to open up our hearts and look to the Lamb of God, to trust in the mercy of God. That's foreign to people who've never had a personal relationship with God. But God wants your heart and He urges you to let Him move you, move you to a place of safety. Let Him move in your life. Let Him bring you hope and direction for now and the future and bring blessing and bring purpose like never before. We started tonight in Washington, D.C., so let's end there. Not too many people will remember the name Arland Williams. Born and raised an hour or so south of Champaign, Illinois, he was on board Air Florida Flight 90, which crashed into the Potomac River in Washington, D.C., just after it took off on a snowy day in January of 1982. Almost everyone on that plane died in the crash, but six people initially survived. They clung to the wreckage in the frigid waters of the Potomac River. A helicopter arrived to rescue the survivors. Rescuers threw a life ring to Mr. Williams. He gave it to the person next to him. That person was taken to safety. He did it every time the helicopter returned until there were two survivors left in the water, Arland Williams and one other. When the helicopter returned and the rescue apparatus was dropped, Williams again gave it to the other passenger. When the helicopter came back for him, he wasn't there. He'd been clinging to the tail section of the aircraft and it shifted and sank further into the water. Mr. Williams went under with it. He saved the lives of others, but he gave his own life to do so. That's the story of the Bible. Jesus came to earth and did everything to save others. He gave his life for you. Not so you'd have to face an uncertain future, but so you could face every tomorrow with the hope that you are accepted and loved and looking forward to a perfect forever. Do you want that? Can you accept that? When you accept Jesus, you accept eternal life. He's coming back soon. Let's accept that life now and stand with Jesus on his word. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, you've identified that there is a system guiding people away from your word. Lord, let us stand with Jesus. Take our hearts and make them yours so we can be truly yours now and forever. We thank you tonight and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Join me next time. Don't miss it. We're going to talk about the United States and prophecy and the mark of the beast. It's going to be great. Tomorrow morning, join me then for more on Hope Awakens.